Hi, um, it's uh, Mr. Townsend here. I'm going to use this video here to um, demonstrate how you would use uh, spectroscopic data to identify an unknown molecule. Specifically, this is for students who want to um, do well in the Achievement Center 91388, which is demonstrate an understanding of spectroscopic data in chemistry. Okay, so uh, the first thing we need to know is we're likely going to be given three graphs. Uh, this graph here on the on the bottom left is uh, the mass spec graph. Uh, we are going to be given a carbon NMR graph uh, and also an IR graph. So we're going to look at each one of these and determine what the unknown molecule is. Okay, um, when we analyze individual graphs, there's a, a couple of important points here. The first one is that um, if we identify a specific aspect from one graph, uh, let's say it was we identified the m, uh, sorry, the molar mass, then we might say, oh, the molar mass of this graph is 47. We need to uh, justify why we said it was 47. So we would have to say something like, the molar mass of this graph is 47. The reason is because the M plus peak is at 47. So that's really, really important. If you don't justify any assumptions that you make, you're not going to be able to get an excellence grade for this uh, achievement standard. Well, let's have a look at the graph here for this unknown sample X. So uh, when we come along, we can see that um, our last peaks here are around about uh, this 85, 86 mark. And in fact, this tall peak here is our M plus peak. So this tall one right here is our M plus peak. Uh, the smaller one down here, which seems reasonably big, is actually just our, uh, an M plus one big peak. And so, so this is our M plus peak here. Um, so the other thing that we might notice on this graph is at this point here, there is a peak. Okay, so there's a peak at 45, which is important because 45 is an important fragment. So let's talk, uh, let's just uh, uh, remember about these two. So we've got a, an M plus peak at 86, and, and we've also got a 45 peak. So if I was going to write a statement about this, I'd say, okay, my M plus peak is at sorry, 86, uh, and this means that the molecule has a molar mass of 86 grams per mole. Okay, so it's at 86, it has a molar mass of 86. So this is what we saw on the graph, okay, that the, there's an M plus peak, and because we saw that, we know that the molar mass of the molecule is 86 grams per mole. Also, we saw that there was a peak at 45, this peak is characteristic of the C double bond O, OH plus fragment. In fact, the 45 peak only comes about when we have this fragment. We've got another aspect to this. We're saying, okay, we saw a peak at 45. This is characteristic of this fragment. So therefore, this is likely has a carboxylic acid as a functional group. So we've got two links in this statement here. We saw this. We know it made this fragment, so the aspect that we're talking about is it's likely to be a carboxylic acid functional group. So those are the, uh, the two important things we got from the first graph. Let's look at the second. Oh, wait a minute. I had another one too that I could have talked about. So the, like the third thing I could say is um, a negating evidence, which is there is no N plus 2 peak. If we go back, we see that it was a tiny, tiny peak. But there was no peak that gave us a 1 to 1 ratio or a 3 to 1 ratio with the M plus peak. So we can eliminate the presence of bromine and chlorine. So we can say, look, there's not an M plus 2 peak with a 1 to 1 or 3 to 1 ratio. Therefore, the molecule won't have bromine and chlorine. So notice from this first graph, we've got three bits of evidence. And every time we put down a piece of evidence, that is, there's no bromine and chlorine, we give um, a statement of why that is true. Or, or we say that uh, because of the graph saying this, this is what we have. Okay, let's look at the next graph. So this is our carbon NMR graph. First thing we notice here is that we have 
one, two, three, four unique peaks. Uh, this uh, has one peak under 50, likely to be a carbon, 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 hydrogen, a carbon with carbon, carbon, or carbon, hydrogen bonds. With two peaks around about 120. Okay, so that's likely to be our um, double bond carbon. And we have one peak about 180, which we kind of know is likely to be a carbon uh, to oxygen double bond. So again, we write statements of these. We need to be very clear that any assumptions we make are backed up by the data on the graph. So let's look what we might write here. So the first one is, okay, we saw four distinct peaks. So therefore, there are four unique carbon environments. It is not good enough just to say there are four unique carbon environments. You must have to say there are four because there were four peaks, distinct peaks on the graph. Okay, we saw that peak that had uh, around about 170. So we can say, okay, the peak at 170 indicates a carbon double bond oxygen. Well, the carbon double bond oxygen is indicated because of the peak at 173. Likewise, we can say that the carbon double bond carbon, okay, that we have two carbons that are involved in a double bond carbon, and we know that it's indicated by the peaks that are 119 and 130. Take care here. Remember, every time we have a, a double bond carbon, we're also we're, we're going to have two. If we have just one peak, it's because they're in identical environments. The last thing we could say, okay, the peak at 20 or the one below 50 arises from the carbon that has only carbon-carbon or carbon-hydrogen bonds. Each one of these statements, again, is backed up by the evidence on the graph, and that needs to be evident if we want to get excellence in the standard. Okay, so uh, here's our IR graph here, and if we ignore anything on the right of 1500, which is our fingerprint region, we have the left-hand side here. We have two peaks of interest here. We have this really broad peak. We could say between... Um, 2,500 and uh, 3,500, roughly. We know that indicates um, an oxygen-hydrogen stretch, or, an, or the stretch between an, uh, the atoms in an OH. And specifically, because it's so broad, it's an OH that is part of a carboxylic acid. We, all know, we also notice, and we should expect, that here at about 17, we have this strong peak. Uh, this peak at 1700 is uh, indicative of a carbon double bond oxygen. And, you know, if we have an OH stretch happening here from a carboxylic acid, of course, if there is a carboxylic acid, there would have to also be a carbon double bond O peak here. So these two support each other in saying from this graph that there is a carboxylic acid. An important point to note here is that you know, there could possibly be another OH bond in this molecule. I'm not saying there is, but if there was, we wouldn't see it because it would be masked by the OH from the carboxylic acid. Also, remember, the carbon-hydrogen peak is here, but it's also marked by this big, broad um, peak here from the carboxylic acid OH stretch. Okay, so when we write this up, we say something like this, uh, we've got a broad peak between 2,500, 3,500. It comes from the stretch of an OH bond and the carboxylic acid functional group. This indicates that there is a carboxylic acid functional group, an unknown molecule. Maybe didn't need that second sentence, but we definitely need to say that that peak comes from the OH bond in a carboxylic acid functional group. And of course, we say the next bit, which is there is um, a peak is also at 1700, which is from that C double bond O stretch. And this supports the assumption that we made in the previous sentence that there is a carboxylic acid functional group present. OK, so uh, that's the two main points. We could have said something there about uh, there was carbon hydrogen bonds, but it's it's not really important. Um, it doesn't add anything to what we're trying to uh, find out about this molecule.
Okay, so once we have all of that data from the three graphs, the next important thing is that to get excellence, we have to integrate the data. We have to put it together to paint the picture of what the molecule looks like. And we can say that this is summarizing. So we've put each of those individual aspects uh, from each of the graphs down, and now we need to summarize them. Now, when we summarize them, um, you have to show clear logical uh, links. So we'll have a look at what, what I've done here. Um, it's very easy to do this type of thing when you have two supporting bits of information from different graphs. You can say things like, in this graph, it shows that there is this functional group, and in the second graph, it also indicates that there is this functional group. So we can be quite confident that this functional group is present. Let's have a look at what I've written here. So I've said both the mass spectra and the IR graphs indicate a carboxylic acid functional group is present. Notice I haven't gone through and, and written out all the stuff that I'd written originally again. I don't need to. Um, though I have said, I have summarized it by saying, look, the mass spectra peak at 45 and the IR um, and the IR through the presence of OA stretch peak have said that there is a carboxylic acid. I've also said that the presence of a carboxylic acid can be supported by the carbon NMR and the IR graphs because in both of those it says that there is a carbon double bond oxygen stretch. So we've got quite a lot of information linking together to say look there's a carboxylic acid functional group. The next bit of information I've said look the carbon 13 graph indicated the presence of a carbon-carbon double bond, as well as five unique carbon environments. Notice I've summarized that it hasn't linked up with the other ones, but it will link up when we put it together in a molecule. The next bit of linking here, or the next bit of summarizing I've put is, um, I've said there has to be four unique carbons. Um, that means there has to be at least four carbons present. Okay, so that logical step needs to be clearly painted out. We, if there's four unique carbons, there has to be at least four carbons. There could be five, there could be six. We also need to identify, look, there's a carboxylic acid in there. So if there is a carboxylic acid functional group, we need to have at least two oxygens. So here's, the, here's where we do the sort of logical jump. So if there has to be four carbons, and there has to be two oxygens, then there has to be those six atoms there. And those six atoms add up to a molar mass of 80. We know that the molar mass is 86. So because the molar mass has to add up to 86, and we already have 80, we can make you know, the big assumption or, or the next logical leap that there's no more carbons or oxygens present. There's only four carbons. There's only two oxygens. And the other six... Um, bits of molar mass left are most probably or will be from six hydrogen atoms. So that's my assumption. That's how I got to draw the molecule that I did. I made that deduction. Okay, so we know we've got four carbons, we know we have two oxygens, and now we know we have six hydrogens. So what do we do? Well, we can draw. And we can draw two possible, in this case there are two possible structures both structures, 2-butenoic acid and 3-butenoic acid, have a molar mass of 86 because the molar mass of each individual atom of each molecule add up to 86. They have a carboxylic acid functional group. They have a carbon-carbon double bond. And they have four unique carbon environments. You don't have to go through and say why each of them are unique. Any chemist can clearly see by looking at each one of those carbons that they are unique. But this final part of the summary links all of our specific evidence that we've got, these four specific points here, to why we chose this molecule as our unknown molecule. Now, sometimes you're going to have to say you might have a choice between two molecules. Uh, the, the question might even say, hey, it could be this molecule or another. And then in that case, you might uh, summarize your information and say, hey, it's, we've got these four bits of uh, aspects of our molecule. It fit with this molecule on the left, but 
you know, one of these aspects doesn't fit with the molecule on the right, so that's why we are not choosing the molecule on the right. Anyway, that's the end of this video. You need to make sure um, that you include all of this information when you write an explanation as to why you chose the molecule you did, and uh, good luck with uh, your assessment.